The following is a Goulash Media production. Goulashmedia.net. I mean, we, we joked about, yeah, we joked about what about the kids, but at the end of the day, I think mostly everyone would, everyone would agree, it's cliche to say, but the children are the future, the kids are our future, yeah. and we have to find an answer to this. A lot of anti-gun people assume pro-gun people just don't give a shit, and mm-hmm. they just want to protect their gun rights, and you know they don't care if your children are getting murdered. That could not be farther from the truth. People care and they want to fix the problem. There's no easy answer. And unfortunately, I think we're at the point in the society where we got some serious cultural problems. Welcome to the system is down. What was that? Is it a cold open? Is it a clip from today's show? No. That's a clip from the bonus segment that I did with John Odermatt on Wednesday of last week. Uh, The episode you will hear today was recorded a few weeks back, well before the school shootings in Florida. So if you're wondering in this conversation why that situation wasn't brought up at all, it's because we are now in the future, and that was recorded in the past, and that's how time works. But if you'd like to hear John's thoughts on that incident and school shootings in general— You can get that and tons more bonus content by going to tsidpod.com forward slash support and joining the Downers Club for as little as $1 per month. So, what's up, Downers? Welcome back to The System is Down, and thanks so much for tuning in every week for your much-needed dose of civil discomfort. Uh, If you're new here, the show is where we work to change the world. One uncomfortable conversation at a time. We're kind of the anti-social media, not to be confused with the anti-social media. Uh, We're here to talk about all things that people just generally don't like to talk about, like conspiracies, politics, and religion. Uh, Because you know, as well as I do, if you post anything even remotely controversial anywhere on social media, it will be immediately met with angry, shouted counterpoints and name-calling, because... The art of conversation is dead. It's just dead. Look around. It's a barren conversational wasteland. Uh, Everyone is far too comfortable just hiding behind their avatars and usernames and feeling like they can say whatever pops into their head without any concern at all for the person that they're talking to, to the point that our entire civilized culture is in some sort of downward spiral into touchy, defensive, angry, childlike chaos. (laughs) And the the media, the divisive media, just adds fuel to the flame, just raking in the money, millions and millions of dollars, convincing you that everyone that you disagree with is evil. They're not. They're people. They're people like you. People with different backgrounds and things that they've gone through that brought them to different conclusions that you just happen to disagree with. But they're not your enemy. So let's talk. Let's keep the civil debates going, let's keep uh, the system uncomfortable, and keep working together to figure out what the hell this life is about, because I guarantee you, the purpose, in the grand scheme of things, the purpose of your life is not calling people names on Facebook. <laughs> I, I, If you disagree with that, then please stop listening to this show, because you're in the wrong place. Uh, now, all that said, today's conversation might ruffle some feathers. Um, To be honest, we're talking about some topics and things that probably could have ruffled my own feathers a few years back until I listened to some people that I disagree with and came to new current conclusions in my life. And it's totally possible that I might talk to somebody in the future and the conclusions that I currently have could change. Who knows? That is how it should be. So here we go. Sit forward. Don't relax. And let's get weird. My guest today is the host of Felony Friday, which is a is one of three weekly shows on the Lines of Liberty podcast. John Odermatt, and completing my trifecta of uh, Lines of Liberty hosts. John, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. Last, but uh, I hope certainly <laughs> not the least of yeah. the Lines of Liberty hosts. <laughs> But yeah, you, I mean, the other guys, they, they're louder, so you know they, they had to be thrown in there first. Uh, and 
Brian, we ended up talking about a movie, so at least with you, we're going to talk about something that you're actually, you know, is actually your your subject matter that you typically talk about. Um, yeah, Br- Brian loves talking about movies, but, uh, you know, maybe, I think my contributions will be a little more valuable, hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, but by the time we're done putting this one out, you know, nobody will remember that Mark was ever even here. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so John, you, you host, like I said, the Felony Friday podcast, which is... Uh, do you want do you want to give some background on yourself and on the podcast? What got you into, uh, you know, discussing felons' rights and that type of thing? Yeah, sure. So I started the podcast. Uh, I guess coming up on well, no, it's more than two years ago now. Wow, time flies. So have more than a hundred episodes out, and it's a part of the Lions of Liberty podcast. You can find it on iTunes by searching Lions of Liberty, and uh, it's every Friday. Surprisingly, published every Friday, <laughs> Felony Friday. And like before I started the podcast, I had a uh, a weekly column that I did, and it was just looking at you know crazy stuff that happened in the criminal justice system, and I'd write an article about it. And I did that for about I don't know two years before I started the podcast, something mm-hmm. like that. So I've been looking at the criminal justice system for a while, and you know somebody might ask, a lot of people have asked me, a lot of my guests have asked me, What'd you know, you do? why are you so <laughs> <laughs> why are you so interested? In the criminal justice system. I mean, you haven't been to prison. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, I mean, really what it comes down to is, I, you know, I was raised in suburbia, very lucky life, didn't grow up surrounded by, you know, a lot of drugs or crime or anything like that, and wasn't exposed to it. So I think I was kind of naive to it. And as I grew up, um, you know, obviously went to college and, and did experience and was sur- surrounded by a lot of drugs, things right. like that. <laughs> but at the same time, it was like in a bubble and I didn't understand um, that people could be sent away to jail for long periods of time. Their life could be ruined. Families could be altered um, by people selling drugs, um, you know, making completely consensual transactions between right. two people and somebody uh, goes to jail for a decade or more. For the stuff that you're witnessing probably some of your friends doing, right? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I witness it on a, a daily or a weekly basis. So. Sure. Um, yeah, that's happening in college. I graduate college and get a job first in Georgia, then get transferred out to California, the Inland Empire, um, if anyone's familiar with that area. I worked in Colton, California, which is not the nicest of areas, not, mm-hmm. not a terrible area, but um, has a, I don't know, a high, high populations of people with a, with a criminal background. So I worked in manufacturing and like the first job when I came in that my boss had me do was to look through resumes since they were always hiring. He wanted me to help with going through resumes and picking out good people to uh, to work in the, the manufacturing environment. So like a good uh, a good management trainee, I went through the resumes and I pulled out all the criminals <laughs> and I passed uh, passed the you know ten or so resumes that were left after the uh, after my boss, the plant manager. And he looked back at me and he's like, what the hell is this? Where's, where's all the people with <laughs> felonies? I mean, we have like Where half the people that work here <laughs> have a criminal background. They're some yeah. of our best workers. I'm like, well, I, I took them out. I mean, you, I, I figured you wouldn't want them. Yeah. So that was that was like my first lesson. And then as I, I worked there for like a year and a half after that, got to know a lot of people um, that I worked with, a lot of my coworkers, their criminal backgrounds. And, you know, I, I, I came to understand that they're really no different than – than you or I or anyone else for that matter. I mean, either they made a mistake or, right. you know, we could argue the you know legality or the morality of dealing drugs later. But either way, you know, they made a mistake in the eyes of the law and it came to uh, came to affect the rest of their life. But what really set me off, I guess, um, on a path that I wanted to do something to change the system is once I moved back to Pittsburgh, I met my uh, you know, eventual wife and we were dating and um, a member of her family, I won't go into detail, a member of her family was, was arrested and ended up being um, you know, convicted of a crime for selling marijuana. What it was, it was an undercover deal where uh, he sold like, you know, an undercover cop came to him. He actually, I, I believe him here in the story, um, he actually wasn't selling. Mm-hmm. Um, he had some roommates that were selling and somehow – uh, I guess the, the cop was focused on their house and he had a previous underage or whatever. But anyway, this cop came to him and asked him for, you know, like a, uh, a gram of weed or something. So he was like, all right, I'll help you out. And he goes, you know, gets a gram of weed from, you know, 
he's the middleman essentially. Sure. This guy keeps coming back to him and asking for him and asking for more. Eventually, he gets up, you know, over an ounce of weed. And I'm sure in that time frame there, he was realizing, well, yeah, I can make some money here. Right. Of course, you'll be an idiot not to. Yeah. Um, so the, the undercover cop went to the point that they could charge him with a felony. And that's exactly what they did. He got charged with multiple felonies, actually. When they actually raided the house, though, the interesting thing is they found paraphernalia and drugs everywhere, except they found nothing in any of his stuff or in his room. But <laughs> right. And the other guys in the house got... Um, I think they all maybe struck plea deals. I don't know. It's, it's, it's foggy what happened, but he got by far the, the worst sentence. And Just because he are, happened to be the guy that answered the door the first time or what? I, I guess. I, yeah. I guess so. But long story short, um, I saw what happened to him. I saw the impact it had on his life. Luckily, you know, my wife's family you know, always, always supported him and sure. – a lot of, lot of uh, you know, support from friends, which a lot of people in prison don't get, and that's why a lot of people end up going, going back in. But that set me on on my path that you know this is freaking ridiculous. Yeah. This is a guy I know to be a good, a good person who sold a plant to another person, <laughs> really, and and uh, ended up altering their life forever. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the word felons is it's a bad word. It has negative connotations or implications. Uh, no matter what you've done, nobody cares what you've done, really. They don't care what the specifics are. They just, as you can attest to, uh, you see felon on their application. You say, nope, see ya. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's a vicious cycle. Once you're out, it, keep end up going back to the same place. Why not? <laughs> I mean, you're going to, if you can't get a job, what are you going to do? You're going to go back to the thing that you know. Absolutely. And, I mean, what happens to a lot of people, I think of all the felons that I interview, and I've interviewed God, I don't even know. Probably I, I, every episode of Felony Friday is not an interview with a felon. I mix in some other shows. I mm -hmm. mix in, of course, we play Is It a Crime, which you wrote the jingle for, Dan. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I've interviewed, I don't know, 60 or more, something like that. And almost all of them say the hardest thing. I mean, it's tough to find a job, but you can, I mean, if you're willing to wash dishes or, you know, do landscaping, you can find a job. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing is find a place to live because landlords don't want to give felons a place to live. If you can't find a place to live, how are you going to progress in society? How are you going to succeed? So right. that's that's difficult. Absolutely. Did you have any other – you said you didn't have a record with anything illegal that got you into this. Was there – was it just that one case and kind of seeing some of your friends go through some stuff? Or was there anything else that uh, you know made you really start digging into this? Well, I mean from a perspective of – like uh, people selling drugs that <clears throat> that was really it. Um, but just looking at, and I kind of realized this recently looking at the, like the war on drugs as a whole, um, I hadn't really looked at, you know, my, my family's past, mm -hmm. what I'd experienced. I had an uncle, um, who was addicted to heroin when I was a kid and, you know, I never, never got to see him growing up. He was, if, you know, if my mom would take us over to my grandmother's house and he was there, we would like wait in the car mm -hmm. And that always kind of weirded me out. And he was, you know, in and out of, uh, of, uh, rehab and ended up, uh, he was on methadone for a while. As I got older, I, I got to know him and he was actually a, he, he was a good guy. Um, made a lot of mistakes, obviously hurt a lot of people with some, with some bad decisions. But so I, I think that recently as I've kind of reexamined parts of my life is really looking at the way that addicts are treated in, in our society um, or the way that really our drug laws criminalize addiction. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a really big thing that, that needs to change. And there's been a, lo a lot of countries that have, you know, taken some steps to progress past that. I mean, you could argue, I'm not going to argue for the exact replica because a lot of these countries are, they're state implemented uh, mechanisms and I'm a libertarian, so I'm not going to really <laughs> agree with that. But just for sure. example, in, uh, in Switzerland, they have, uh, since like the nineties, they've had this program where you can get into it. You have to be, uh, obviously you have to be addicted to heroin. I'm not sure how they, they test you for that, <laughs> but, uh, they've never had anyone overdose. Mm -hmm. And most people, like you would think if they were, you know, giving out supervised heroin, you, you would think that people would just be going there forever, that they would, if, if I can go and get, <laughs> you know, a, a steady, you know, a, a fixed dose of heroin, I know it's safe. 
you know, why would a heroin addict ever stop doing that? <laughs> the fact well, that I keep coming back proves I'm addicted to heroin. So you're going to have to give it to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's what you would think. But a lot of people actually get off of heroin. I know it's surprising without getting on another drug like methadone or something. Sure. Um, so it's is it I like mean, a it's microdosing really more than... thing or is it straight heroin? Like, do they dial it back and, you know, weed them, wean them off it or they just give them heroin? What's the situation? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. I'm not sure if I can answer it like specifically, but I know they sure. do. I know they do wean it down. I'm not sure to what degree. Um, and I think it has to be from the person's consent. You know, saying you wean me off of it. Nice. And most people get off of heroin. Would you say, as somebody who digs into felons on a weekly basis, uh, drugs? I mean that that's the main thing we're that keeps coming up here. Is that the main issue that uh, that causes these human statistics? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, from what I look at, it's, it's mostly drugs. Um, a lot of it is not actually somebody dealing drugs, but I've had a couple guests on. One that comes to mind is Amy Pova. She's the founder of the can do foundation. That foundation was really big behind the push. If you remember when Obama granted clemency to you know, tons of people, hundreds, right. thousands of people, um, she got tied up with her, uh, I guess, I guess her husband at the time was, I think, selling ecstasy internationally. And I, she probably knew about it. I forget the, the specifics of the case. But what it came down to is um, when, the, uh, when the feds come in and they charge you, you know, they throw a bunch of stuff at you. They overcharge like crazy. Mm -hmm. If you won't strike a plea deal, if you won't testify against somebody else – end up going to prison longer than the person who was actually selling the drugs on a conspiracy charge, which right. is what happened to her. She was not involved in selling any drugs. And I've had a couple of guests like that, that just, just from being on the peripheral, maybe answering a phone or, you know, driving someone, um, even if they didn't know, um, they can get nailed with a conspiracy charge if they don't take that plea deal. Sure. So drugs, what's your stance? Are you, are you pro all drugs? Are you hardcore Anarchist, are you? Uh, do you, is there a line? Um, yeah, I, I mean, for, to a lot of people that are listening to this, is this is, you know, I have a lot of people that are outside of the libertarian sphere. Your show is primarily libertarian, so it might come as a surprise that this is even a discussion that people have. Uh, I feel because if you had asked me probably five years ago, I would have been like, obviously they're all terrible and we shouldn't be allowed to have them. So, what's your what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's surprising at all. I mean, I, I work on a libertarian campaign, and through doing that, I get to see a lot of uh, a lot of people pushing back on Facebook to uh, to comments. And the the guys, who, the guy who the campaign I work on, I might as well just say it's it's Dale Kearns. He's running for Senate in uh, in Pennsylvania. Sure. <clears throat> but uh, so you get a lot of right wing type people on there, mixed in with libertarian ideals, and. A lot of pushback. A lot of people just go crazy right. when you mention uh, uh, legalizing drugs. They can't even imagine a world where, where drugs are legal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess my stance is that I guess to put it as straightforward as I can is that marijuana, heroin, mm -hmm. cocaine, meth, everything, all these drugs should be as legal as tomatoes. And right. the reason I say that, the reason <laughs> I make that stipulation is what's happening a lot right now in the United States with marijuana, I mean, I don't think people are even ready to talk about the other drugs. I mean, <laughs> sure. people are probably laughing, laughing at me for, for saying that, listening to this show. Right. But with marijuana, what happens obviously is, is the government gets their foot in there and, and they want a cut of it and it becomes tax dollars. And unfortunately, a lot of the people, pro-marijuana people um, with normal and those type organizations have latched onto that as a way to sell uh, legal recreational weed or even um, – you know, medical cannabis um, as a way to to raise to raise tax revenue. What a wonderful thing to put more money in the government's coffers. Right. But obviously, that's it's terrible. It's terrible for you unless we get a cut of it. You know, then it's fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, you got to start somewhere, and starting with "it's all fine" is you know going to make a lot of people shut down and laugh you off the off their their phone off this podcast. But um yeah, so so your stance though is all we should be allowed to have whatever we want. We should be allowed to kill ourselves in whatever way we want or do whatever we want to our bodies. 
Yeah, I mean, well, in reality, people can do that right now. Right. I mean, people can drink themselves to death. Um, right. You know, there's lots of drugs out there that are 100% socially acceptable that are probably worse than marijuana, for example. I mean, you could argue that caffeine and obviously alcohol is is right. probably probably a lot worse than marijuana. But uh, yeah, when you get into these harder drugs, cocaine and and meth and heroin. You know, a lot of people think that, and I, I used to think this too, and I really changed my viewpoint when uh, I had a guy named Johan, Johan Hari on my show, wrote a book called Chasing the Scream, which I would recommend that everybody read, or at least listen to the audio book. It's a phenomenal audio book. Sure. Um, I had him on, and he talked about it, the, uh, the link between addiction and depression. And of course, there are, you know, triggers in your brain that, uh, you know, people you obviously can become physically addicted to these drugs, but not everyone does. I mean, there's a lot of people that, for example, there's a lot of people on Wall Street that use cocaine just as a uh, as sort of a, uh, a way to, to raise their productivity. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of people in uh, Silicon Valley who are maybe they're micro dosing on uh, ecstasy or some sort of. Uh, uh, some sort of uh, you know, m- mushrooms or, or something like that, a psychoactive drug like that. But I, I guess at, at the end of the day, um, my view on it is simple. Legalized tomatoes and the government does not have the right to tell an individual what they can or cannot ingest. Um, you know, who who owns your body? Do you own your body or does a third party uh, who's never met you uh, own your body? Does the collective of the United States government own your body and tell you what you can and cannot put in it. You know, are some people going to abuse that right and, you know, become addicted and ruin their lives? Of, of course, of course they might, but they could do that in countless ways anyway. They could do that by eating, you know, fast food every day and having a heart attack when they're 40 years old, or they could do that by drinking themselves to death. There's, It's not up to society. It's not up to a uh, coercive government to, to tell individuals how to live their lives. And on top of that, I think if drugs were legal, you know, less people would be using them. Less people would be becoming addicted to them because a lot of the reasons why people even OD in the first place is because the drugs that they're using are not, uh, you know, the, the dose is uncertain. There's the whole thing going on with uh, heroin being cut with fentanyl right now and people, you know, having no, no idea what, what's in the, the drugs that they're using. They're in some some back alley in a you know motel six shooting up heroin and they and they OD. I mean, why would why do we want people, you know, shooting up in the back alleys of society? Bring mm-hmm. that stuff forward. Let these people get help. Um, you know, let these let addiction be treated as a, a medical problem rather than than criminalizing it. Um, I'll go to half of my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, no, I, I love it, uh, and I, I agree. Um, but but John, what about the children? Ah, uh, yes, it's the children. <laughs> and if I had a dollar for everyone that said that to me and you know, actually be- a- before we get into that, I want to I have a question on what you just said. Uh, you said that uh if it was legal there would be less people using it. Is there like statistics to that point to that or do you have evidence to show that or justify justify the statement, I suppose. Yeah, I mean we we can uh I mean I don't know if I know the stats inside and out. I definitely mm. don't, but sure. I know that Portugal had a horrible, horrible drug problem, and they have, you know, almost completely decriminalized all drugs. And they, it has been from a, you know, a government, uh, government-assisted program, mm. where they have, you know, safe places where people can get needles, and I think safe places where people can, similar to Switzerland, where they can get um, safe doses, um, where they're certain of what they're taking, and. I'm not sure what exactly the numbers are, but I know that there's been a dramatic reduction in the amount of people using drugs. Hmm. Um, do you have any idea why that is? <laughs> I mean, it's just like it's confusing to because for me, if I, I've never even smoked weed in my life, but if it were mm-hmm. legal, I'd probably try it. And especially knowing that I would know what I'm getting, um, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable in trying it out. Um, don't need to, don't really care. Uh, probably the same with all the other stuff. I'm like, eh, I'll try anything, whatever. Um, what is, what is stopping people from, especially if they know what they're getting from 
doing it more or getting hooked on it. And I, I did not really, mm-hmm. I'm playing devil's advocate for the most part. No, here, no, that's a, really that's don't a really know. good question. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, when you're younger, police officers come into your school and talk about cigarettes or even marijuana being a gateway drug, right? Did, did do you remember hearing that when you were younger? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if this is proven, but I have a theory that the reason that these things are gateway drugs is because, you know, it's obviously it's easy when you're 16, 15 years old to get a cigarette. You have an, you know, an older friend in high school buys sure. a pack of smokes, whatever. A lot of convenience stores don't even card, whatever. Kids get cigarettes. So the reason I, the reason I think that's, that is a, a gateway drug, um, maybe there, there's some camaraderie around smoking cigarettes together. People do that together. Um, it's normally more of a, a risky element to uh, more of the risky people in high school, right. uh, people who are, you know, not afraid to get in trouble. The do cool that. kids. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it might expose. So it starts with a cigarette and then you're exposed. Oh, this guy's smoking a joint. So smoking a joint. And then you decide you want to get some, some, you know, some marijuana yourself. You want to, you want to start getting high. So mm. someone introduces you to their dealer, you meet their dealer and this is all on the black market. You can't, you know, say, Oh, I, I want to try marijuana when, you know, an 18 year old kid today, unless you're in, I don't know what the law is in Colorado. I think it's 21. So maybe that doesn't apply, but an 18 year old kid today can't go to Seven Eleven and buy a marijuana cigarette the same way they would a, uh, a, a nicotine cigarette. Right. So they got to go to a drug dealer. So they're, they're buying, you know, maybe they start out smoking a little bit of marijuana off the drug deal. They meet somebody else who is maybe doing some cocaine. And of course, the drug dealer is trying to make money. So they're going to sell you whatever you want. Right. Um, <laughs> sell you some cocaine. If Maybe they'll you know, sell you some heroin. So it, it, it just gets worse and worse from there. So my theory is one of the ways that it will definitely help is you remove that element. Um, people aren't going, if they're just going to try marijuana, they're mm-hmm. not going to go to a shady drug dealer who has a, uh, you know, a profit motive, which is not, um, r- really it's, which is fine to have a profit motive, but the, it's, uh, I guess it's shielded. He, he's shielded from sure. the, the full consequences because there's, it's, it's the black market. It's not out in the open. Whereas in contrast, if all drugs were legal, you know, I don't think you would be able to get necessarily, you know, go buy heroin at 7-Eleven or <laughs> right. go buy crystal meth at a, at a, you know, the grocery store or whatever. <laughs> because, I mean, I don't think people are going to want to take that risk on. There'll probably be some other ways of distribution that, that would open up. It would probably become more accepted into the medical community. And it, right. I mean, there's the equivalents which are already used in the, in the medical community, but I, I think I think that's the element is or, or that's that's the uh, the big change is it doesn't if if someone's just trying to, you know, make their way into uh, trying drugs just by mm-hmm. you know trying the lighter one, smoking marijuana, per se, you know, they're not uh, exposed to to everything. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's one of my theories. Sure. Do you think there's uh, do you think it's the the coolness factor might go away if it was legalized too like kids who you know try marijuana or try even cigarettes or something because it's bad and it's edgy and they're the the cool crowd because they're taking the risk if there's not that risk there well, I guess there still would be for kids but for I mean with all those things if you see your parents smoking weed suddenly weed's not that cool anymore <laughs> or whatever um, do you do you think that that would have any psychological effect as well if it was all legal? Yeah, I, I think it definitely could. I mean, you can just look at the difference in the drinking culture between right. uh, the U.S. and Europe. I right. don't know if you've ever been over to Europe, but uh, no kids when they're <laughs> <laughs> going to in Italy or France or Spain, and I, I haven't been. I've been to Iceland and Scandinavian countries, but same thing up there. You know, kids are allowed to drink a little glass of beer when they're they say when they could see over the bar, you know, when they're eight, eight <laughs> years old, they could drink some beer. Nice. So as they get older, I mean, I'm not going to say they don't party. Obviously, Europeans still party, right. but it's not it's not just this crazy uh, binge drinking. Right. It's um, not just I don't think, abusive because you're like, this is the time where I get to be bad. And then you just go crazy like Americans. Do. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. Well, so got to ask. 
We got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but what about the children? What about the children, John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about the children? And uh, I get asked that, or I get that response a lot. And I have a you know a young daughter. She's two and a half years old, mm-hmm. and you know I plan to you know when she gets older, I'm going to talk to her about all of the bad things that can that can harm her. You know, mm-hmm. I've already told her not to eat. Tide Pods, so we're, we've crossed that bridge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, the uh, real scourge of our society at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but the gateway I mean, pod. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think it's it's sort of a uh, it's sort of a cop out, mm-hmm. and I think it sort of highlights our larger problem we have in society, where we have a lot of absent parents right. who aren't parenting. Um, a lot of parents are tied up in their own career, their own, their you know trying to climb the corporate ladder, whatever right. they're watching. They're wasting Netflix all their and- nights on podcasts, talking to other <laughs> assholes, <laughs> exactly. pontificating about potential room, things, talking, <laughs> talking into a microphone, yep. you know, all this, all this crazy <laughs> stuff that people do. Yep. But I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's up to the parents to talk to you, to talk to your kids. And, you know, just like I said, before alcohol is obviously legal, not legal for kids under 21, but it's easier for them to get access to it. And that is just as dangerous, especially in the short term. I mean, a young kid, a teenager can kill themselves, can drink themselves to death, having no idea what the hell they're doing. Right. Um, pretty, pretty easily, really. Um, it's, it, it happens pretty often, which is, which is a, a horrible thing. Yeah. But I mean, you get, it's just, it's up to the parents, up to the parents to, to talk to your kids, to educate your kids. And I love to go to, uh, go back to, I think it was 2012 when, uh, Ron Paul was running for the GOP nomination. And I forget where it was, maybe the South Carolina, it was some Southern, uh, Southern city that was hosting it. Sure. And of course they were always trying to nail Ron Paul, trying to get him, trying to, you know, get him on something. And they started talking about the drug war. Of course, Ron Paul comes out giving the libertarian talking points, talking about everything I said, where drugs should be legalized, you know, mm-hmm. individuals, you know, are sovereign, they own their own body. And the moderator comes back and goes, Mr. Paul, do you think heroin should be legal? And he comes back and he goes, what are, are you afraid that if heroin was legal that you would start doing it? And everyone just starts <laughs> booing. The crowd's booing. Like, I guess all these people are afraid right. that if heroin was legal tomorrow that they would become addicted to heroin. And I mean that's that's essentially what it is. I mean, you can't possibly handle your own free will. Yeah, the government must do it for you. <laughs> that's the argument against libertarianism. Right. Libertarianism, I guess. Yeah. So bottom line, um, you know, if you don't want. Or if if you're afraid for the kid children's safety, um, maybe be a less shitty parent. And the same way you don't, you know, let them drink alcohol, I assume, or maybe you do. Um, not that I think that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, as you you said, but you don't let your kids just do whatever they want. You know, that's that's how you stop them from becoming addicted mm-hmm. to heroin. Just the same way you're doing it right now, that's how you would continue to do it. Exactly. <laughs> Because they can get heroin right now, right? It's probably, yeah, and it's and they can do it in a in a shady way where you'll have no idea. They probably are happen. right now. It's it's six forty seven at night on a Tuesday. Yeah. Do you know where your children are? They're probably doing yeah, heroin. Probably some of you listening to this right now, <laughs> your kids might be going to get heroin. In fact, when they get home, you should probably ask them if they were out buying heroin today. <laughs> you probably should. <laughs> All right, uh, let, let's switch over to um, let's talk about some guns. What's your stance on guns, John? Stance on guns. Stance on guns is they should be legal. No restrictions. Everybody who wants a gun should have a gun. Um, that's not to say I don't I don't want to force guns on people. If you don't want a gun, if you're not comfortable around guns, please do not buy guns. Stay away <laughs> from guns. But sure. every able bodied able bodied American who wants to be able to defend their family, defend their own life. Um, I think it's only it's only smart to uh, to buy a gun, to learn how to use it, to uh, train yourself, to take you know be responsible, much like w- with drugs, personal yeah. responsibility. Um, that's that's on the individual. That's not on the government to uh, to come up to instill that that personal responsibility in you. 
Sure. So you believe that um, my neighbor Joe Bob should be allowed to own a bazooka and be strung out on heroin at the same time? <laughs> For all you know, he might be doing that right now. <laughs> Probably <So>. is. <laughs> Joe Bob's a crazy guy from what I hear, but, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, someone's going to say, you know, that's crazy. Why would you say that somebody who's higher in heroin should have a gun and, and they shouldn't, but you know, how, how are we going to know that they're higher in heroin and have a gun unless they're, and really if they're higher in heroin and have a gun, they're probably just asleep holding their gun in the corner or something. So it's probably not that big of a problem. <laughs> probably more of the problem is somebody on PCP with a gun or something like that. Sure. Well, and let's go there. PCP and a bazooka. <laughs> PCP and a bazooka. That's a bad recipe. And <laughs> It's a great yeah, rap name though. <laughs> <laughs> that person's probably going to end up uh, doing something stupid. Hopefully they don't hurt someone else, but, uh, They'll probably end up infringing on someone else's rights, sure. and uh, you know, I, I would just say that it's probably more of a reason why you should be armed, because you know, obviously PCP is illegal right now. Yeah. You can't have a bazooka right now, and I don't think many people have bazookas, but <laughs> you know, people can have you know, plenty, plenty of legal guns and be on whatever substance, be out of their mind, or just be mentally ill. Right, and that's not going to. I mean. A type of gun being illegal, the, these substances being illegal, is not is not going to help you in a situation where, you know, a crazed person were to either attack your family or or attack or attack you. And that, I mean, that's general generally the stance that I come at it from. Also, um, just from a, uh, I guess more of a constitutional stance. I guess not not really constitutional. I mean, I don't like to come at it from the Second Amendment angle because. Yeah. The Constitution can always be changed. Right. Um, it could, it's very hard to change. Can be amended, but, you but say? It, but it could be. <laughs> what are these things? You can't amend these, this Constitution? <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but so, so from, I guess the other angle is the government has these weapons, right? Um, the government has every, every grade of weapon, grade of firearm you can imagine from bazooka all the way down to you know, the, the, the smallest pistol. Right. And if they have access to that, then why should the American citizen not have access to that? Obviously, there's the big arguments that, you know, the government, you're not going to be able to take down the government if the government uprises or whatever. If they're, You're not going to be able to overthrow the government. We never will be. Um, so why do you need these things that could harm your neighbors or what have you? What's your response to that? So uh, the United States government has been at war in Afghanistan for for how long? Since 2001, <laughs> I yep. think. Yep. And it's the big, mighty United States government, and they're fighting the uh, the Taliban, right? <laughs> which is just armed people with uh, bazookas, maybe, maybe some uh, maybe some machine guns, but nothing nothing crazy. And the U.S. government can't win. So yeah. I, don't, I don't buy that argument. Sure. Well, you're on a cons mostly conspiracy show here, though, so there's a good chance that a lot of people think that they don't want to win, but that's a different conversation altogether. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that is a good point, but Russia Russia had the same problem, tried to do the sure. same thing. I guess the argument would be maybe Russia didn't want to win either, but why'd they ever leave then? Sure. That's fair. That's fair. Hey, Dan Smots here. I'm taking a second to interrupt myself talking to talk about myself because, you know, I don't get paid a penny for the hours and hours that I put into creating this show for you guys in your greedy little ears. And I've got a family to feed. To make that happen, I run my own media business called Goulash Media. If you have a need in anything from video production to graphic design to audio production and beyond, you can get it all for a painfully fair price at Goulash Media. In video, I do weddings, music videos, commercials, pageants, plays, etc, etc, etc. For design, I do photo editing editing, album art, logos, branding, business cards, merchandise, you name it. For audio, I do engineering, production, editing, jingles, and, well, podcasts. So if you've got a media need of any kind, or if you'd just like to give a little something back and help keep my children fed, check out all the endless options at my website, goulashmedia.net. That's goulash, G-O-U-L-A-S-H, media.net, where we cater to the little guy with the big vision. <sighs> okay. I posted um well my wife posted in the forum you may have seen it uh earlier today because i had to tear my entire studio apart the last two days twice 
um, and was in the process of putting it back together, which is why I was late for this conversation. But she posted uh, just asking for some, you know, anti-gun arguments because I wanted mm-hmm. to throw some out there and get your thoughts. She, I mean, I don't, I will say this, I don't own a gun, but. I'm not going to tell you my address. Uh, I currently don't own a gun. By the time you get here, I will. Um, so <laughs> I, I I don't have a huge stance on this. I 100% agree with you. Um, I, I think that we should be allowed to own whatever we want, and we should be judged on what we do, not what we might do. Um, but, you know, uh, well, my wife works, or she used to work at a bank, and there were a bunch of Democrats there that had some arguments and she would come home and be like, well, what about this? And I didn't really have arguments for some of them. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let me dig in here and find some good questions for you and we will address some of those. Uh, John Barnhouse, which these these are not like people giving actual arguments. These are like them giving examples of arguments that they've heard for why guns should be outlawed or so there, there's no anti-gun people in the system is now <laughs> there there probably is yes but there's not a lot in fact like the first yeah. couple were like no they're all stupid basically like all the arguments shouldn't be listened to very <laughs> angry responses um for whatever reason maybe i've built an echo chamber not sure but <laughs> um somebody said uh nobody needs high capacity magazines uh what's wrong with mandatory biometrics built into every weapon so only one person can fire it go mandatory biometrics built into a weapon Mm -hmm. um smart guns smart i mean i don't think there's anything per se wrong with someone buying a smart gun i mean they can buy a smart gun the problem comes in where there's a regulation where you have to own a smart gun and how would that be implemented um you know we're at the point right now in society where you can 3D print a gun, right. and that's only going to get better and more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. So trying to biometrically trace all weapons so only certain people can fire them, um, I think is kind of a ridiculous argument. Um, not that – I know this is just a hypo- hypothetical, I sure. guess, but there, there are a lot of people putting that argument forward. But yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. I mean I, I could actually understand it, someone wanting – wanting that for their own gun safety around their house, maybe if they don't want their kids to get their hands on, on a gun like that. I mean, yeah, that, that could be useful. I personally wouldn't want to do that because I wouldn't want to worry about it malfunctioning or something like that, or right. having to grab it quick and you know, it's dark and someone's in my house and trying to grab the gun the right way. So it lets me fire it. But right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see a problem with the uh, with the technology. It's kind of cool, I guess, but the problem is uh, is the force behind it. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the first one, which was I guess a second, uh, a different one. He said uh, nobody needs high capacity magazines. Well, I mean, this 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 is one that liberals always come up with. And there's many states that have restrictions. I mean, New York and California come to mind. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Forget exactly what the restrictions are. But yeah, the idea is, you know, why do you need more than than five bullets? Right. And I mean, just look at you can look at the riots in Los Angeles. You can go on YouTube right now and Google. I think it's Los Los Angeles riots, Korean store owners, and what you'll see is video footage of Los Angeles being torn apart, and then they cut to some Korean store owners in uh, I don't know what part of LA it's in, and they're all walking around armed with uh, rifles and uh, semi-automatic rifles and rifles Mm -hmm. more than uh, more than five bullets in their magazines and their stores are untouched rioting going on (laughs) all around them their inventory everything everything is safe they're able to uh, able able to defend their property and if they're only allowed to have just just one magazine um, just with five bullets then people might be a little more ballsy to uh, to try to take them down but uh, that's that's just one reason. The other reason is, I don't know what the hell kind of situation I'm going to end up in. I right. mean, <laughs> what if I have I have no idea? What if somebody gets pissed at me because of my Felony Friday show and they, I don't know, there's like five people that uh, attack my house. I, I mean, I I, I <laughs> should be able to defend might. myself with whatever means necessary. <laughs> they might riot your house after this podcast because you know. <laughs> 
you're all about the heroin, it seems like. But <laughs> <laughs> I actually hate. I, I mean, just come back to heroin. I actually really, really hate heroin. And when I was, I mean, obviously, you know, from seeing it, the impact it had on my mm-hmm. uncle's life, and growing up, that was the one thing. Through high through high school, through college, after college, I always told my friends, if I ever find out you're doing heroin, I'm going to beat the fuck out of you. <laughs> Can I swear? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and none of them ever did. So maybe that's a that's a. I wouldn't say to tell that to your kids. You sold maybe it. Maybe you do. I don't know. It's up, it's up to you. That's your, that's your own parenting to take that. But you can tell that to your friends. At least uh, guys can. I don't know if that'll work with uh, with women. But uh, yeah. Well, not in today's day and age, you know. <laughs> Um, so, so what about, uh, the obvious argument? Like, um, I mean, the argument that you made is basically you have the guns to defend yourself. So the five bullets, you know, that doesn't really get the job done. What about, um, outlawing guns? There are, I haven't, I don't know the statistics. And this is one of the arguments that I heard from one of her friends, but, um, and I don't necessarily have an answer for it, so I'm curious to your thoughts. But you know, these other countries that have completely outlawed, outlawed guns, their crime rates have dropped tremendously. Um, is that their crime rates or is that their gun crime rates? Because obviously those would drop tremendously. <laughs> but um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I'm not an expert in uh, in this either. But, I mean, just from, from what I know about, about this, people always reference Australia, right? Mm-hmm. And they're talking about what they reference as a gun buyback program. Uh, progressives are, are big on gun buybacks. And it wasn't actually a you know, voluntary program, which is what they tout over here. Um, right. it, was, you know, it was mandatory. But even being mandatory, I think it only confiscated the numbers. They're not sure how uh, the numbers vary widely. It's something like 500,000 to a million guns. So it's a pretty big difference <laughs> right. where they confiscated. But it was only like a quarter of the guns in Australia. Mm-hmm. So there's still the other, I mean, the other 75% are still out there in Australia. And when you talk about the crime statistics, I think it's, I think they're only referencing the gun crime, um, not necessarily uh, crime overall, which I think, I think has at least remained the same or gone up in Australia. Sure. You look at uh, countries like Great Britain, which have definitely seen an increase in violent crime along with their, um, escalation in gun control laws you know in a, in france you know a lot of cops aren't armed and i'm sure you've seen the the comical videos where there's uh you know five five cops around one criminal trying to arrest him and he's right. swinging a club at them and they and they can't get close enough to to handcuff him <laughs> but yeah. i mean it could be i mean i'm not going to say that it's impossible to to ban guns somewhere in the world. And Mm -hmm. it's, I'm not going to say it's always going to be, um, you know, a detrimental thing, but I will say this, there is no way, there's no way in hell it'll ever work in the United States. (laughs) There's far too many guns. And one of my, one of my favorite quotes from a recent uh, podcast that Brian did on electric Liberty land with Owen Benjamin, (laughs) Owen Benjamin was talking about just the, uh, how divisive this country is right now. And he was going on some rant saying, you know, uh, liberals, progressives need to be careful because half of the country, the only thing preventing them from, you know, taking over from really violently attacking the the other side Mm -hmm. is Jesus. That's the only reason (laughs) they're not doing it because Jesus tells them not to. All right. Stop stop bashing on their religion because that's the only thing that's stopping them from shooting you. (laughs) But uh, yeah, so you're welcome, Brian. We still got got your plug in there. Yeah, there you go, Brian. That'll be uh, 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> but there's no way you're going to confiscate guns in America. And that is, I mean, I think that is the argument that progressives are making. Um, you, you always hear common sense, gun control. Common sense, just common sense, gun right. control. Who's you know, common sense? Common sense, background checks. You know, who's just, common sense? <laughs> Mine or yours? Yeah, who's, who's, who's common <laughs> sense is it? Um, but there's no way you're going to pass a law and they've done it. They've done it in, uh, I believe it's Massachusetts where I think they outlawed semi-automatic rifles. I think mm-hmm. it's Massachusetts. I could be wrong. I wrote an article about it anyway. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter <laughs> because it, it, the same thing would happen in, in any, any state in the U S and this is, this is uh, one of the most liberal States is they passed that law that, that these, uh, these firearms had to be registered. It wasn't confiscation that, that they had to be registered and like 5% complied 
Right. Uh, the other <laughs> other ninety five percent just said, you know, screw you. Come so, get it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not possible. Yep. Gotcha. I like it. Um, okay, let, let's look at a couple more here. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody has a really long one, and this will probably have this be the last, but, you know, it's, it sounds interesting. Uh, he says, I, I think way too many people own guns that shouldn't. Also, a huge amount of those people don't have safe storage to protect them from being removed by, what about the children? By a child or someone with mental issues, not allowing them to make good decisions. If I could, if I could only begin to explain how many vehicles we uh, get into, that we get into my body shop with bullet holes ever since Iowa passed the concealed carry laws, it has went up tremendously. I am a gun owner myself, and even I think uh, that things have gotten way out of hand. Being, uh, being an Illinois resident. Uh, if you have no felonies and are not on any psychiatric drugs, you can get a gun. It's literally that simple, and I'm sure Iowa is just that much easier. That's uh, that's what scares me more than anything. I don't feel the reason to have a concealed carry or the need to ever have to use it as protection, but that's just myself personally, not saying I'm speaking for others. Blah, 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 blah. Whole nother paragraph. Go, John. <laughs> um, well, just to pick two things out of there, um, and feel free to ask me more follow up because I can't, I couldn't di- digest all of that. But one thing oh, that yeah. jumped out to me that we didn't talk about at all, <clears throat> and is a, a big talking point of anti gun people, is uh, mental illness. Mm-hmm. You know, even on the right, a lot of people on the right say, you know, it's not, it's not the gun. It, you know, the problem is. We have people who are mentally ill doing these things. And of course, I mean, if you're going to kill a bunch of people or kill yourself, there's probably something mentally wrong with you. Right. I mean, I, I, hate, I hate to say it, but that's only a bunch of people, not just one person. <laughs> or if you're going to kill one person. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just wonder if there's a line there. How many people or you can kill? Gonna try to kill one person. <laughs> there's probably something mentally wrong with you. True. Um, but with that being said, just because, you know, that is that's a fact that doesn't mean that people who have mental problems, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who have mental issues and are able to manage them, mm-hmm. either through the use of drugs, which I'll talk about in a minute, or um, just through, through other means. Um, for example, I had Aaron Comey um, on my show who had a uh, history of schizophrenia. He tried to take over a, uh, tried to hijack a plane. And then he just recently, this was years ago when he tried to hijack the plane, sure. spent some time in prison for that without ever being convicted but anyway it's another story um he recovered and he's now recently he ran for mayor of new york city nice <laughs> but <clears throat> the reason the reason i bring that up is you know we're saying mental illness we got to get guns away from people with mental illness who defines what mental illness is who defines when someone's recovered and why should mentally ill people not have the same rights as you and i uh, do you lose some right when you uh, have ADHD or, you know, when you have schizophrenia or w- when you have when you're bipolar? Do you lose a right? Do you lose a right to defend your own life at right. that point? Because that's exactly what people are saying. And that's that's a fact. I mean, just no one's going to I mean, obviously, the left is not going to put it that way in their argument. Right. But that's what they're saying. We want to take people's rights to defend their own life away from them which is insane. And it gets even crazier just to talk about psychotropic drugs. And of course, it's no coincidence that a lot of these mass shootings occur when people are on psychotropic drugs. And to tie in with that, um, if you're going to, so they'll say we should ban, you know, ban, uh, ban guns from all people who are prescribed psychotropic drugs, or even in some States, they're trying to do this in Pennsylvania right now because we just passed medical marijuana or people who are using medical marijuana um, lose their gun rights, mm-hmm. which is, is just insane. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So someone who is treating themselves medically in a way that even if it is proven that psych- psych- psychotropic drugs, tough <laughs> word to say, um, are somehow responsible for causing people to become violent, that doesn't mean that everyone to, who's taking them or everyone who is using medical marijuana should lose their right to defend their own life. Um, I think the question should be, especially when it comes to these psych- psychotropic drugs, is 
why are we prescribing them to people <laughs> if they're making people become this violent? Right. But uh, it's just <laughs> It's a different podcast altogether. Um, so uh, I, I, let me let me look back at the question. Make sure you covered most of it. I believe. Oh, the um, the uh, concealed carry laws changing in Iowa and body shops getting you know a lot more cars in with bullet holes. Any thoughts on that? Uh, but first thought is that's surprising. Um, right. I mean, I wonder what part of Iowa he's in. When I think of Iowa, I mean, I've never really spent too much time in Iowa, but I've driven through it. It seems very, very peaceful and tranquil and and nice. (laughs) Well, if Um, you want people to stop shooting each other, don't put them in the middle of a cornfield and raise them there. You know, that's it's just just asking for trouble. (laughs) I thought Iowa was like Field of Dreams. Kevin Costner. It is. It is. That happened, I believe, out in Davenport, about 45 minutes from where I am. It's not heaven. It's Iowa. But yeah, yeah I, I honestly have no idea. I mean, that's a, uh, I don't know where his body shop is. I don't know anything about the people who frequent the body shop. Um, who knows? I mean, I, I, I don't think that that's a reason. That's a reason to take people's rights away because you've seen some more cars with bullet holes. There could be other underlying reasons for that. There could be maybe, for example, maybe the drug trade has ramped up because mm-hmm. drugs are prohibited in Iowa. And the only way to arb- not the only way, but a frequent way to arbitrate disputes is uh, through violent means. Since drug dealers cannot go to court to arbitrate a, uh, mm. you know, if they have a disagreement over a transaction or if someone steals from another uh, drug dealer or commits fraud, um, that's the reason why there's violence in drug dealing. That's the reason why you look back at alcohol prohibition. Why you had uh, shootouts with the mafia with machine guns? You know, mm-hmm. when's the last time you saw a shootout at a liquor store? Yeah. Right, <laughs> it's true. So, would you say that the way to uh, minimize gun violence in a concealed carry state is to just legalize all the drugs? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's funny you say. That's exactly what Michael Wood said, who, yeah. who's a big, big progressive. He said that. He, he used to be very anti-gun. Michael Wood, I keep plugging people on my show, but I just talk to so many damn people. <laughs> it's all um, right. It's all right. He was he was a Baltimore cop, and he you know exposed a lot of corruption in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> you know he's he's been all over the podcast sphere. He's been on Rogan several times. So I highly recommend checking him out on my show or on Joe Rogan. But anyway, he is pretty. Anti-gun. Now you're plugging Joe Rogan too. Just say he's on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just plugging everybody. <laughs> Uh, he, he's he's very anti-gun, but he even said if he'll side with libertarians, if drugs are legalized, then he will back off that anti-gun stance just because so much of that violence is uh, is baked in to the prohibition. And if you take that away, if you bring this stuff and, and you shine a light on it and people are able to actually uh, use the court system for disputes rather than, you know, other uh, more nefarious means, then – Things are things are safer, in my opinion. Sure. So the uh, I'm not going to look back at it. I'm just going to say that the last part of this question, the only part that we have not gotten into, is John. What about the children? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I guess it's the same answer as uh, as the drug part. Don't um, be a bad parent. Yeah. Don't don't be a shitty parent. Um, <laughs> keep your guns away from your kid. But at the same time, I will say I think it's very important. If you are going to choose to own a gun, this is very important. If you're going to choose to own a gun, you're going to choose to have it in your home to defend yourself, absolutely have it locked away, Mm -hmm. absolutely know how to use it. And then when your kid gets to a, uh, you know, a, an age where they're responsible and all kids are different. Some kids aren't responsible when they're freaking 20 years old. So it's different for some kids at 12 might be ready to, uh, to learn how to, 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 uh, use a firearm. It's different. If your kid's a dickhead, Maybe you don't want to show them how to use a firearm. Maybe you don't want to tell them where it is. I, I don't know. But uh, use your own discretion. But I think it's important that for most kids who, if they're well behaved, if they you know understand, if they sort of understand consequences, um, you should teach them how to use it. Teach them to respect right. firearms. Teach them um, that they are you know they can kill people. That gu- guns can be used to kill people. That they are dangerous. The same way when you're teaching your you know son or daughter to drive when they're 16. Right. You're teaching them that a car can kill someone. You are driving a vehicle of death. The same thing with the, with a gun. So it's it's no different. Absolutely. So educate your children. Don't be terrible parents. 
That's it. It's turned into a, a parenting podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, one last thing, John, um, you have on your wall there, I can see your No Victim, No Crime poster, which was beautifully designed mm-hmm. by somebody. And I will, uh, m- my question is, um, how strongly do you believe that? Do you think that there should be any preventative laws, like anything that, you know, avoids <clears throat> any of these terrible things happening in any situation? Or do you believe across the board, No Victim, No Crime? Yeah, I mean, you're referencing like uh, pre-crime laws, right. um, which is which is a lot of what we have today. I mean, everything from DUI laws, where there's no accident or property damage. I'm talking about just someone going through a DUI checkpoint, mm-hmm. all the way from that into you know we talked about the uh, magazine restrictions and and stuff like that. Those are all pre-crime laws, right. and of course drug laws. Those are all pre-crime laws. Um, I don't think I don't think there should be. Um, I mean, I, I do believe in uh, in law and order to the point where, if there is an actual victim, if someone has been harmed, if force has been used against someone, if fraud has been uh, committed against someone, then absolutely. Then there's if there's a victim, there's a crime. But yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think we need any pre-crime laws. I think it would would be a much more productive society, um, even. Even without changing the way, you know, a lot of libertarians, and I agree, we should have more of a private police force, but Mm -hmm. I think the world can be okay with a public police force with a lot less laws. I mean, there'd be a a huge difference in uh, in all of our lives if uh, police actually use their time and their resources to go after real crime, to go after- (laughs) To protect and defend. (laughs) Yeah, to, to defend, to- Keep us actually to to you know defend the communities and uh, and, and and keep them safe instead of uh, chasing down uh, your neighbor Billy Bob who's selling you know quarter ounce of weed right now probably. <laughs> no, he's, he's sorry 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 Billy Bob and uh, cradling his bazooka right now. Uh, so, do you think that um, uh, like drinking and driving, it's cool? Just you know you know you you do what you do as long as you don't hurt anybody. It's all right. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's it's cool. I, I don't think that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, t- to the point where do do I think there should be like an arbitrary limit of people drinking and driving? Where if you cross this this uh, this line on a breathalyzer or, or a blood test, that you're that you go immediately to jail? No, I think that's ridiculous. I think people handle handle their alcohol differently. Sure. Um, I think in a more free society where we had a system of private roads or community owned roads or, um, you know, something like that, there might still be, uh, stipulations like that Mm -hmm. where, you know, the police force, you know, through the consent of the community might be monitoring these roads. And there could be something like that. I don't know if it'd be an arbitrary limit or more of just a, just a field test of if someone can, can function. And I don't think, you know, I'm not going to say that you know, some somebody should have their life ruined over over something like that. I'm right. probably coming off sounding like a, a statist to all libertarians <laughs> out there. But all I'm saying is, you know, if if I owned a road, and you know, if someone owns a road, then they're taking responsibility for keeping that road safe. I could, you know, I could be sued, right? Somebody right. could come after me if 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 you know, if someone dies on my road if there's a sharp turn and a drunk driver or someone who's had a few too many beers comes around and and kills someone, I could end up somehow tied up in that lawsuit. So I might want to mitigate that by putting some kind of stipulations in place that would make that less likely to occur. But yeah, when it comes to drinking and driving the way it is today, uh, the, the way that it's enforced today, I think it's ridiculous. I think DUI checkpoints are just insane, a waste of time, waste of resources. And um, they, they ruin far too many lives uh, as well, you know, um, but I'm not defending drinking and driving. <laughs> and also I think the, uh, the free market has, has done a lot recently to, uh, to help out. Obviously taxi cabs in a lot of places, we're not filling the void to sure. give people an option yeah. to get to get to the bar back to the house safely. But uh, mm-hmm. Uber and Lyft have, have stepped in and I, I, I don't think any studies have come out, but I, I'll bet that uh, DUIs have, have come down in places I'm where sure. Uber and Lyft yeah. are are uh, pretty frequently used. 
I can name a few people by name that I know personally that uh, have, you know, become more responsible adults because of Uber and Lyft. So yeah. uh, I won't, but I could. Um, name them. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, John, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, do you have anything that you want to plug? Plug your show. Tell everybody where they can find out more about you. And maybe we'll, you know, have you on at some point to do like a Q&A or something, because I'm sure a lot of people have questions about this stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can find us on Lions of Liberty. You got our website, just lionsofliberty.com. And you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, the Lions of Liberty podcast. We have a show every Monday hosted by Mark Clare, which is more of a, it's more of a, uh, I guess, interviews with uh, more libertarian uh, leaders, mm -hmm. um, people talking more philosophy, things like that. If you're looking more for like a, review of current events, some comedy, some of that stuff mixed in. That's that's Brian McWilliams' show on Wednesday, Electric Liberty Land. He's had he's had some some great shows recently. Not to I mean Mark's had some great shows recently too. <laughs> um, I don't know when this is going to air, but check out uh Mark had a debate between two libertarian thinkers, Walter Block and uh Bob Wenzel, mm -hmm. um, talking about uh, basically Trump and should or should not libertarian support him. So as someone who's not a libertarian, I think that'd be interesting for, uh, for people to listen to. For sure. If there's any listeners out there who aren't libertarians, which I'm sure there are. And then of course, uh, my show, uh, felony Friday, every Friday, you can find the full archive to just my show felony Friday at uh, felonyfriday.com. That takes you to the archive. And if you want to find just my interviews with, uh, with felons, uh, people who have, who have spent time in prison, you can find that at lionsofliberty.com slash felons. Awesome. Absolutely. Very cool, man. I really enjoyed it. And I, I agree with you on basically everything. Um, the only thing I, I disagree on is maybe the my neighbor with PCP and you know the bazooka. But <laughs> other than that, <laughs> spot on. And I'm sure there are a lot of people that do disagree with you in the Systems Down Forum. And John, you are a member of that. So if anybody has questions for him, go tag him and give him hell. So, But <laughs> John, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you're always welcome. And I hope we can do it again sometime. All right. Thank you, Dan. Dun, 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 dun. Hey, hey, thanks so much for listening. If you liked it, you're welcome. If you didn't, uh, just sit there and ponder it for a minute before rushing to the computer and screaming into the vast void of the Internet, uh, yelling at John for his heretical ideas or whatever you disagree with. Uh, but when you do decide to give John a piece of your mind, you can do so on our free Uncomfortable Discussion Forum on Facebook. Just search for The System Is Down Forum, ask to join, and then you will be able to tag John in a post and give him your counter-thoughts civilly, of course. Please, for the love of God, don't give in to the Facebook. And if you know someone who you think would benefit from hearing this episode, I would ask you to please share the show with just one friend this week. Whether you agree with everything you hear or not, I truly believe that what we're doing here together... Uh, with this show and with the forum is important in today's, I don't know, social climate or whatever. If I didn't think that, I don't know if I'd have the drive to bust my hump to bring you these status quo challenging yet delightfully entertaining episodes for free every single week. But also, if you'd like to support the show and if you'd like to get two to four bonus episodes of this show every single week along with our massive backlog of content and much, much more. You can join the Downers Club, which is our patron program for as little as $1 a month. And of course, if you'd like to sign up for more than a dollar, I'd allow that too. <laughs> we have different perks for the higher the level that you sign up at, but every penny is seriously beyond appreciated for real. And I'm doing my very best to put your donations back into building this show bigger and better and spreading these valuable ideas of civil discomfort. So if you'd like to join the club and help out, you can do so by going to tsidpod.com forward slash support. And finally, if you could please just take five minutes out of your busy schedule this week to subscribe to the show on iTunes so you don't miss a single episode. And also, if you could... Just leave us a happy review so newcomers know what we're all about. They know what they're getting into and what to expect. And there are no surprises other than 
you know, all our normal surprises around here. But uh, that's it for me today, guys. Uh, thanks again for being the coolest, weirdest, uniquest collection of listeners in the world. And if you are so kind as to allow me back into your ears next week, I'll be here first thing on Monday with some more uncomfortable conversations. Until then, question everything and stay uncomfortable. Thanks. This has been a Goulash Media production. Goulashmedia.net. This concludes our broadcast day. Click.